I'm thrilled to have Michael Kitsis with us today. I have followed his blog for at least 40 years, maybe, maybe not quite that long, but it, uh, and he's well known in the retirement planning space. And uh, so, Michael, welcome to the show. Awesome. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate the opportunity to join you. Love, love getting a nerd out on finance for a while. Well, I've got a ton of questions to ask you. Plus, if we have time, I will look into the into okay. the chat and see what folks are asking. Some awesome. have sent me some questions ahead of time. Okay. I want to start maybe in, in, sort of in a different way than than maybe you're used to. We'll see. But I followed your blog. I mean, okay. I guess, I don't know. When did you start your, your blog? Oh, Nerd's Eye View uh, sort of had a double launch. Originally in 2008, kind of tried blogging, didn't really get blogging in 2008. I was maybe a little early for our industry. Relaunched in 2010. It's really been going full steam for 12 years yeah. now. So it has a well-earned reputation of content that's you know very well researched. It's very in depth. You know these aren't 500 word articles, right? I mean, no, no, right. no. Well, closer to 5,000 than 500. Yeah, right. You take a deep, deep dive, and so I would love it if you don't mind sharing your process. How do you go from idea to like you said a 5,000 word article? How does that work in your world? So. So the starting point of process for me, it really just comes from conversations I have out, out in the world, out in the advisor marketplace. So um, talking to clients that we're serving, talking to other advisors in the community, uh, which for me literally formulates into like a, 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 an Evernote note, because I'm you know using Evernote since forever, since early days of Evernote, that just becomes my dump, sort of my dumping ground, like, hey, I had this interesting conversation with the client. Like it sort of sparked this idea. Like I want to grab that. I might come back to that at some point. And so I just started keeping this list. And cumulatively over the years, the list grew huge. There are hundreds of ideas on that list of things that I might research or dive into further into at some point. And so then as I began a regular like writing and blogging process, it would really just be, hey, I'm going to pull out my list and look through and just say like, so which one of these is is piquing my interest right now that I want to go deeper on? And and most common that would just be, uh, you know, like if I heard it once, it's an interesting idea. If it came up twice, uh, that might be notable. If it comes up at least three times in in yeah. a short period of time, like okay, this is this is a this is a trend. So it's time to actually go deeper on this and figure out like what can we do to delve deeper on this and find our our angle, our take on it, and so. Kind of that combined with I am a bit of a voracious reader and consumer of content and, and research and have been since forever, just part of how I'm wired that, you know, high volume of information plus high volume of conversations with the people we serve ends up with just kind of sometimes seeing opportunities to connect dots that other people don't connect and saying like, hey, I think there's there's something here that we could share out to the to the uh, primarily advisor community that we write for, yeah. but obviously the the joy of the internet it's it's out there for everyone and you know, I, I love how many in the fire community over the past 10 years have really become readers and followers of the blog as well yeah so when you decide to take one of those ideas out of evernote and actually produce an article are you just sitting at the computer typing away do you dictate um what's that process look like so so i so i am a i i am a writer i am a typer uh, i was the child of two computer scientists that learned maybe speaking teaches typing when i was seven years yeah. old so so i've i've got very good 10 finger typing i i really do type about 110 120 words a minute it's like i i can type more or less flow of thought which means a lot okay. of writing for me is essentially just take what's like bounce around my head brain dump it out onto a page and then I can go back through and try to edit it down and winnow it down and refine it down. So in, in the early years, it was it was literally a like just brain dump sort of process and then go back in and try to figure out like, what did I actually just say? How do I like make some order yeah. and sense out of this? Over time, it actually evolved into much more of a structure. And if, if for anyone who's followed our, our site for years, you will have noticed that it's actually evolved into a much more standardized structure in around in around how articles actually get produced on the site now to something that I, I call a three by three by three structure. Mm -hmm. So for any article that we're writing now, there's always to me like there's one key insight. There's one key point like there's some here's the thing that I want you to get at the end of the day that you didn't know coming into this article like that one eureka light bulb above head moment we may set up a lot of information to get there but there's always like one key insight takeaway 
that I want to make sure you have. If I'm going to do that, then there's usually three things I need to cover. There's some kind of background information, what you need to know to get the point. There's the point, the, the insight, whatever the thing is. And then there's some kind of instructional takeaway. Like, what are you going to do with that? Mm -hmm. And so our outlines flow into these kind of three prongs, like the information, the insight, and then the instructions that you're going to take away from this. I, I call it now our, our three eyes format. And from there, you get to say, well, how are you going to make each of those key points? Okay, so like the information, you know, usually there's like three, three supporting concepts that set up the information, three supporting concepts to drill down the insight three takeaway action items in the instructions area at the end and so we've got three uh three sort of key points we're trying to make three supporting concepts that go with each of them if you now write three paragraphs for each concept you're trying to convey you have just written an approximately three thousand word article with nothing more than i got three points i got three concepts for each point and i got three paragraphs for each concept well, that's great um, Okay. I don't always write it that literally, although every now and then I'll do it just for the fun of it. We did an article a year or two ago about why, I, why I'm why i not a fan of tax diversification as a concept. If you go back and look at that, it is, it, is three, it is three key points, three supporting concepts for each point, three paragraphs for each concept, and three sentences per paragraph. Well, I, I, I smile because... One sentences, and it, yeah. and it comes together very well. So... Uh, uh, I may perhaps gamified it a little bit on, on our end, but, you know, writing with a repeated structure, I mean, everybody's got their own style and voice of how they, of how they write. That was very much one that I, you know, kind of came to over time. And as, uh, you know, Rick's commenting in the, in the live stream, there is sort of a weird magic of threes. Anytime you're writing and storytelling, like it, it just kind of works. So I'm a big fan of threes and, and working around threes and, you know, that's probably 10, 12 plus years of a writing, iterative writing process for us. But it's come down the point where now we actually have multiple writers on the Kitsis platform and they all get trained into this three by three by three outline format and structure. And we've actually been able to make it like a, a, a repeatable, transferable writing process. Yeah, no, I, that's great. Yeah. And, and I smile because that tax diver diversification article is something I want to talk to you about in a minute. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Uh, so I take it, you mentioned Evernote. So if you're reading something that catches your attention and you think this is a great insight, I may use it at some point in the future. I take it for you that goes into Evernote somewhere? Well, so, so uh, yes, although I, unlike, I guess, some people, I'm not necessarily a big article clipper, like making a big old library of articles. Because frankly, I did that for a while and then realized like, I had like a library of 472 articles and, and no time at that point to even go back and read them. I was like so enamored with clicking them to come back to them, but I want to consume so much stuff. I just ran out of stuff to consume. So I to, for sort of my own parsimony, when I'm, when I'm going through Evernote and I'm adding in like, here's a topic, here's an idea, here's a thing I might go after. I really try not to capture much more than sort of like, here's the key point thing. A couple of, maybe brief reminder notes for for myself just so if i'm picking this up a year or two from now i'm like i don't have to do that like what was i think like where right. was i going with this i can't i can't remember so i'll capture enough for that and then i may put in there a hyperlink or a few of like hey here's the research article on ssr and i was reading that i think i want to come back to as the anchor for this so i may grab like a url or, or two but it's not much more than that because, you know, as I view it, and, and part of this is just kind of my nature of, I see so much stuff. Like I still, I see more things I would want to explore than I have time to explore. So at some point I know yeah, yeah. the list down. So my goal as I'm going through this is not like, you know, to start pre-writing the article idea the moment I have it, because then I'm going to run out of time to actually sit down and like write the thing I want to write. I try to capture as much as I can need to capture so that, if I come back to this later, when I'm looking at a lot of different ideas and saying what really strikes my fancy, like what do I want to dive into? Because frankly, you got to like what you're writing at some level or you can't write, certainly at the long form level that we do, like you got to be into the topic or it's going yeah. to be torture to try to write right. that. Uh, right. It's a really easy when you're into it. So I just try to capture enough so that when I go back later and say, okay, like today's a writing day on my calendar, I want to write something. Let me pull up the list. 
what is striking my passion to say, okay, I'm ready to just spend the day rolling up my sleeves and nerding out on this thing, going all out on it. I've got enough that I can pull it back up and get going again, but I can also get topics out of my head quickly enough when I'm capturing them that I don't spend hours trying to record the details of an article idea that I don't even end up coming back to because sure, I sure. end up in another direction. Sure. Okay. Well, good. Um, okay. Let's talk about stuff people are probably here to to, to, to learn about. Sure. Uh, uh, although that that was great for me. I, I can tell you that. Um, so let's start with Roth conversion since you mentioned tax diversification. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a lot of tools to help folks try to figure this out. There are tools designed for advisors. There are now a lot of tools for the consumer. Yep. And I've used, at least on the consumer end, quite a lot of them. And where I've come out, you know, there's always this, well, what's your, what's your marginal tax rate yeah. going to be at one end versus the other? And I think, except in extreme cases, the answer is probably I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, there, and, I, and I want I want you to push back if you disagree. But particularly when you're years away, I mean, goodness, you know, obviously the tax laws could change, the RMD age uh, could change and has and probably will again, or likely that it could. Are you going to do qualified charitable contributions uh, or, or, or not? What will your traditional retirement accounts grow to? Yep. That's going to affect you know, the whole yep. analysis. Um, and I kind of came away from it with the thought that, again, except in extreme cases, it's a best guess. I mean, the tools might help you crunch the numbers, but you got to give the tool all the assumptions you want it to use. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I have two questions for you. One is, is am, am, I, am I describing this? Is there, is there more... Is it not as bad as I'm making it sound, right? You know, and, 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 and if it is uh, that bad or that difficult, do you have rules of thumb yeah. that you think through that you, that you might use? So, so yes and no. Um, try to think out how to frame this. So there are a lot of folks where the answer at the end of the day is something to the effect of, I'm in a middle-ish tax bracket now, and I'm probably going to be in a middle-ish tax bracket later. And unless something extreme happens, that's probably really not going to change much, as, as you've noted. We absolutely see that for a lot of clients we work with. But the sort of the irony and the reality of that situation is, well, like, if your tax rate's kind of middle-ish and it's not really going to change from middle-ish, it doesn't matter. Like, that's the whole point of kind of the raw first traditional framework. If your rate's not actually going to be that different in the future, it doesn't matter. The whole focus that I think about when I look at this to say, okay, where are some opportunities to make sort of broadly Roth versus traditional decisions? Because sometimes it's hard Roth and sometimes it's hard traditional. Yeah. Almost by definition, I'm looking for the scenarios where I do have a an expectation of a material change in circumstances or outcome in the future. So... I think of it more from the end of what can drive change where I get to materially different brackets and outcomes. And from there, there's actually a lot that starts to come forth. Uh, you know, past two years, COVID, like I'm unemployed, I got laid off, I'm a business owner and self-employed that's having not such a great year. A lot of folks had some low income years. Like, look, I don't know if you're going to be low income every year for the future. I don't know if you're going to be high income for every year in the future. I don't know whether you're going to retire super rich or affluent or what, but I'm pretty sure the year that your rate is zero, it's probably going to be not better than that in the future since your rates can't really go negative. So, hey, here's an amazing opportunistic year. We're filling, we're certainly filling yeah. negative income. Maybe we're filling 10 or 12% bracket. Maybe we're even filling 22 or 24% brackets, depending on where, where your income or affluence is. Um, we get similar situations for people that are in high income years. Maybe that's like a, a particular high income event. I, I'm i selling a business. I work for a company that's you know having a liquidity event or options exercises. Maybe it's just, hey, I'm, I'm in some peak earnings years and this ain't going to last forever because at some point I'm going to retire and my rate's going to be something lower than this because maybe I'll go from 30 something percent tax brackets to 20 something percent brackets or from the 20s down to the 10 and 12 percent brackets. And so, again, that's a big bracket change to say, OK, I don't know what my long term overall rate is, but I'm pretty sure this is the best earnings years I'm going to have in my career. So we are not touching a Roth at all. We are jamming this full of traditional dollars. I'm getting my tax deduction at my absolute maximal right. rate. And at some point in the future, I don't know whether my tax bracket's going to be lower or a lot lower, but I know in any of those scenarios, 
that's a better outcome than today for me to contribute to traditional today. And later I'll get around to doing a Roth conversion when my rates are lower. So if you if you think about it from an opportunistic frame in the first place, yeah, there is sort of an effect like it 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 only matters or it primarily matters in the years where income is deviated more significantly from whatever your long term baseline may be. But that's great. That's when it matters. So if as I if as I think of it from that perspective, like the truth is, hey, in you know, depending on how stable your income is, like it literally might not matter which one you choose in nine out of 10 years. So don't overly fret about whether you're going to be like going from 22 to 24 because that 2% rate doesn't actually matter a lot. And you can more than offset that just by changing states when you retire. But hey, I'm like 10 or 15% higher in a year than I'm going to be in the future. I'm 10% lower than I'm going to be in the future. That one year can be a really big year to suddenly grab what could be tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars of income that you shift to one account or another, which at a 10 plus percent tax rate differential, like in that one blink of a year, I can create 10, 20, 30 plus thousand dollars of lifetime wealth plus cumulative growth all in the future yeah. from getting it right at the at the moments that it matters. And okay. so I, I sort of think of it more from that from that frame in the first place. Now that still necessitates at some point you got to figure out at least the general neighborhood of what your what your rate what your rates look like in that kind of distant future retirement. Yeah. And yeah. granted there's a lot of uncertainty around that for uncertainty of market returns and the rest. But I still find like it, it's not that hard to to get a general neighborhood for most of our situations. I've got some baseline level of social security that I know is gonna be coming. I can project that out for whatever my income levels are for myself and or my spouse. Okay, for a lot of people, that's at least filling a 10 or 12% bracket. So, okay, whatever I'm doing out of the gate, I'm starting north of 12. Yeah. Uh, on top of that, I may have pensions or social security. Uh, so what, social security. I may have pensions or some other fixed income stream. I may have real estate or some passive income stream coming through. From there, I can project some level of what my retirement portfolio looks like in the future. Now, granted, it's going to have some fairly wide error bars around this, but I probably got some sense of like, so when I retire, are we talking like 500 grand or 5 million? Like, right. I can probably figure out if I'm closer to one of these than the other. If I'm going to be taking a couple of percent of withdrawals off of that, okay, well, a 500 grand portfolio is probably kicking mm -hmm. off at least four, five, six percent of some kind of taxable income that might be an RMD, that might be uh, 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 interest, that might be a withdrawal from a retirement account. I may generate a lot of different ways, but whatever exactly it is, it's income. It's going to show on top of my tax return. It's going to stack on top of my social security. And as I just start layering in those elements, known fixed income streams in the future, and my projected portfolio with some moderate level of taxable income distributions that's coming off of it, I'm going to get to some baseline that says in retirement, my baseline dollar amount is going to be something around this, and it's going to put me in some bracket. And I'm going to have right. a pretty consensus to where that bracket is, in part because the brackets are actually decently large. Maybe you happen to be really close to a threshold, but you know the range from 22 to 24% is like hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. come. So all I need to know is like, I'm not in the thirties and I'm not in the teens and I've got a pretty good sense as to where I'm ending out. Well, let me, let me, let me, let me ask you this then though, kind of, if I can just, Please. because that all makes sense. But now it started with this idea that if you kind of are in the middle uh, now and in the middle in retirement, it doesn't much matter. Yep. Let me, I'd like to push back on that just a little sure. bit, if I may. Did you read Vanguard put out a paper called the better Roth conversion, BETR, break even tax rate? I don't know yep. if you read that paper, but the basic yeah, well, idea we, was, yeah. We, if, if we, you, we published on that originally uh, many, many okay. years ago. That actually came okay. from uh, a white paper we did. Oh, good. Okay. Because, you know, if assuming you're paying the conversion tax from your checking account, rather, you know, from a taxable account rather than the, 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 the IRA, um, that number, you, you'll, you'll start to get more and more benefit the longer you leave the Roth IRA alone. And so... I've always felt that if you think you're kind of even on either end, it, it, the Roth probably makes more sense if you can pay the tax, you know, out from outside the, the, the Roth. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So so there's a couple of effects that, you know, that take what is otherwise sort of a baseline. So if you think of this way, like, 
the baseline is um you know current versus future tax rate if they're same it doesn't matter and and all else equal on cash flows it it, it literally doesn't matter is that that's the math of it but not all else is always equal and, and there there are sort of two primary things that that shift the not all else is equal uh bucket one is the nature of required minimum distributions right all, all else being equal like I can keep the money in the Roth longer than I can keep the money in the traditional because the traditional starts getting the boots for at least a couple percent a year once I hit was 70 and a half, now 72. Uh, the second factor that throws off the all else being equal is if I've got some traditional dollars in a retirement account and I've got some other money in a taxable account, investment account, bank account, whatever it is, and I project that out in the future, it's not really just a matter of what is my IRA grow to versus my Roth. It's really my IRA plus some like taxable dollars versus a Roth, except if I convert to the Roth, I can use the taxable dollars to pay the bill and make it go away. And that's important because the Roth grows really efficiently. Right. And that, that that taxable side account, that bank account, that brokerage account does not grow so efficiently because it gets dinged every year for interest, dividends, and capital gains. And so a traditional retirement account plus call it a side account does not grow in parallel with the Roth. The IRA grows in parallel with the Roth, but the side account does not because it's got drag on it. It's got tax drag on it. Right. And so that can produce a disparity. And the more years that you compound, the more the disparity that the more that disparity builds up. So we'll we'll give you a link you can share out with your with your readers. So we, oh, we just put out a report on this all the way back in May of 2009 around how you get this differential that says, hey, there are scenarios where my tax rate could be lower in the future, but the Roth is still better because of this tax drag side account effect that gaps okay. out that gaps out over time. Well, so that, that would be great. It it's absolutely true. It's absolutely there. The caveat to it that we found in in that research is it still takes an astonishingly long time for that break-even tax rate to move in, in what I'll call any, any material way. Okay. So if you start modeling that out for a retirement contribution and you know, like you started at, I think we originally did the paper with a, a 25% state and federal tax rate, like just as a, a baseline, you'll call it the middle-ish tax brackets. After 10 years, your break-even tax rate goes from 25 where, where you started to like 22. So it moved a few points, but if I can move from the 20, you know, if I can move from the 22% bracket down one bracket to the 12, a tax bracket change is a 10 and the break-even shift was only three. Yeah. So it still gets dwarfed by the bracket change. After 20 years, you've moved from 25% down to about 19 and a half. So it's a five and a half percent differential. But I can still change this by, you know, one bracket change or one state change, depending on what state I live in and what state I may retire in. Even when you get out to like 40 or 50 years of running these accounts in parallel, the break even tax rate shift goes about eight or nine percentage points. So not not trivial. I mean, like that that's some real dollars right. especially added up with compounding. But I can still trump that with one tax bracket change or, you know, moving from certain high tax states to low tax states. And, so, and I take it those, it, those numbers, yep. the changes in the break-even tax rate, a key assumption is how tax efficient the taxable account would be, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So the more efficient you are in your tax account in the first place, so just, you know, I've got more buy and hold investments, I'm not turning them over as much. Uh, the the irony is just like while while there's a lot of bad challenges of low yield low interest rate environments for a tax efficiency end it's good like I'd I'd rather have a low yield S and P with a lot of appreciation than a high yield S and P with no appreciation because the dividend whacks me in the face with the tax bill every year and the appreciation I only have to take uh, as a hit whenever I actually do a sale and turnover so ironically like low yield environments of recent years actually is helpful from a tax efficiency perspective. But yes, the, the efficiency of whatever's going on in that side account ab absolutely is a factor of this as well. The more inefficient you are, the bigger that gap is, the more efficient you are, the less drag there actually is. And the more that break even tax rate or, or the, the less that break even tax rate has a has an impact on you. So right. it's definitely there as an effect. 
but it can still get trumped by tax bracket changes or relocation in state, which again, doesn't necessarily mean like, therefore we ignore it. I, you can still put it in the picture. Yes, what it means is, hey, if everything else is even, really think like I'm handing out, I'm hanging out middle brackets and they're not changing. Yes, there is a small gentle, I'll call it, there's a small gentle tailwind for the Roth all else being equal. But to me like that, that doesn't, and I don't mean to say that you were, imply you were saying this, but like that doesn't excuse still going through the exercise of trying to figure oh, out, God. is my tax bracket going to look materially different in the future, either because of changes in wealth, changes in circumstance, or even just changes in state, because yeah. state tax really has material, you know, the magnitude of state tax changes when you cross state lines is quite material relative to some of these other effects. Yeah. So you'll have to at least be looking at that and thinking about what that looks like in your future to decide whether whether um, the break-even tax rate drive should should be the driver for you or not. Sure, sure, good. Um, and by the way, you mentioned sharing a link. Uh, for those watching, all the links that he gives me, I'll put below the video when we're done. I'll also throw throw them either directly or a link to the video in the newsletter. Uh, awesome. Goes out. I, I do see that link. I don't think I can share it live. That I yeah. Know. I don't know if we can share it out live, but we'll we'll get it captured yeah. for. Hour. We'll put them. Yeah, we'll put them below the video. Um, so You're thank welcome. you for that. Here, here's the one other thing that I would frame around this. Just like having done this and been through the exercise for a lot of years of of sort of doing these analyses and trying to figure out where we're going to come out in the future like here here's what i see in practice um most client situations where we're trying to plan around sort of the, like these roth versus traditional tilts or like when do we want to tilt towards one or the other there are really three primary transition points where it matters the first is when you cross uh, so about $80,000, $81,000 of income as a married couple, that's when you go from the 12% bracket to the 22% brackets. Like it's a big old 10% jump. The other brackets around that don't matter as much. Going from 10 to 12 is not a big leap. Going from 22 to 24 is not a big leap, but like the 10 to 12 is a really big leap. That's one of the brackets that's worth spending some time planning around. The second big threshold comes when you get to the top of the 24% bracket and you're looking at crossing again, you go to 32, it's a big 8% leap. After that, you go from 32 to 35, 35 to 37, it's like they're two to three point increments. The jump from 24 to 32 is about $330,000 of income, taxable income uh, that, that puts you across that line. And so those thresholds, call it about 80,000 for married couples, about $330,000 for married couples become the two really big planning points because getting it right around those bracket thresholds where you have eight to 10% jumps really, really matters. Okay. So what that means in practice is I find for, for I'll call it frankly, like the, the, the average American, you know, we're trying to accumulate a couple hundred thousand dollars so that we've got a nest egg on top of social security to get us through retirement. Most of most clients in that situation were optimizing around the 10 and 12% bracket. If I am efficient for someone with a couple hundred thousand dollars of, of net worth that they've saved over the years, I can be efficient enough to keep you from ever climbing above 12. So some combination of uh, uh, efficient management of capital gains, harvesting gains at 0% rates, uh, doing partial Roth conversion. So we just don't build up so much IRA dollars that your RMDs knock you into the 22% the bracket later. We'll do whatever tactical conversions we can do to fill up the 10 and 12% bracket. So we need to get proactive to say, hey, let's just do enough of a Roth conversion this year. Maybe it's five grand, 10 grand, 20 grand, 30 grand, to take you right up to the 81 threshold so that you never go above 12. And if I do that and I whittle down your IRA enough, you're not going above 12 now because I don't convert that much. And you're not going above 12 in the future because right. I've converted enough. Once you get folks that start managing to accumulate seven figures of net worth and you start projecting that out in the future with market growth and you stack it on top of what's probably going to be a pretty decent level of social security because if you got enough income yeah. to save that much in wealth, you're probably on the higher end of social security as well. It gets really hard to stay under $80,000 of taxable income. Like the sheer momentum of your wealth, once you get to seven figure investable, 
starts to push you over that line. So once you're over that line, we're out of the, I'm going to fill the 12% brackets and we're into, okay, I'm now in the big, massive 20% 20, 20 brackets in the middle. The 22% bracket starts at 80 grand and the 24% bracket ends at 330. So I actually get a huge range in there where I can do rather sizable Roth conversions at basically no material change in tax rate. I mean, maybe I bump myself from 22 to 24, but like I ain't getting back to 12. And if I do this efficiently, I can avoid ever getting knocked into 32. Right. These are usually larger dollar amounts because by definition now I've got one or several million dollars, but I can do much larger conversions. For clients in this situation, we're often doing 100,000, 150,000, $200,000 Roth conversions. I can fill straight up to that $330,000 line at a relatively flat rate of 22 to 24, hang out there, seal it off. And if I do that yeah. repeatedly year after year, right? If I just do that for someone who retires, that like even on what we'll call it a regular retirement schedule outside the fire world, like they retire in their early 60s, I have almost 10 years until RMDs begin and I'm knocking out one or $200,000 a year, like I can chip away into a multi-million dollar Roth without going to the 30% brackets now and keep you from going to 30% brackets in the future, even with wealth. Yeah, yeah. Once you get above that threshold, and it takes a lot, now you're talking typically about households that are accumulating north of five to $10 million of net worth, so just the, the sheer passive flow of income that you can't help but kick off from that portfolio is going to knock you above the the 24 tax bracket now you hit a third threshold which is essentially i'll fill straight up to six hundred thousand dollars of income for a married couple which is the top of the 35 percent bracket which is essentially a nice way of saying anything that's not 37 percent anything that's not top tax rate i'll fill right up to the threshold above that and so those sort of three bend points kind of are, are the, the average American, the mass affluent, we're often filling to 12. Uh, anyone who's in sort of the million or few dollars bucket, great place to be. We can fill up to 24. And then anybody who's above that, we get into the, as long as it's not the top tax rate, that's better than something, we'll, we'll chip away whatever we can get there. Okay. Uh, and there are a couple of, of you know, side factors that can come in because at the end of the day, this isn't about tax brackets. It's about right. marginal tax rate and everything that goes into the rate. So, uh, you know, if I'm still in the in the 10 and 12 percent brackets and I've started Social Security, you have to be really careful that the phase yeah. of Social Security really jacks up your marginal tax rate quite a bit and can be something that we want to work around. And if you happen to be really, really close to a Medicare surtax threshold, you often at least want to make sure you you don't just cross the threshold. You know, in the grand right. scheme, we see a lot of clients that are really anxious about the Medicare thresholds. And you know, I, I don't like to see anybody get hit by them that we can plan around them. But if you do the math overall, like by the time you actually hit a Medicare threshold relative to your income at that point, it's basically the equivalent of about a 1% surtax on your income. Like that's all it actually comes out to be. It, you know, it'll be about $1,000 by the time you're making 100 is what it comes out to be when you do the math. Now, if I'm like $1,000 away from that threshold and I knock myself over the line and I get a $1,000 surcharge, this is not good. That's like a 100% yeah. tax rate on the last $1,000. Right. So if I'm really close to the threshold, I do wanna make sure that I don't accidentally bump myself over the threshold. But short of those who are really right up against the threshold in the first place, we actually find that just the effective planning around Roth versus traditional decisions so trumps the impact of like a thousand dollar Irma threshold at the margin yeah. that it's much more impactful to do good Roth planning and and just let the Medicare taxes fall where they may, as long as you don't just put yourself like a dollar on the wrong side of the line because that was a really expensive last dollar. Yeah, yeah, it's a cliff. You go off. Yeah. Um, let me uh, let let me uh, sort of change directions. Uh, talk about withdrawal strategies for a moment. Mm -hmm. And I have a couple of questions here. Sure. I know you've done a lot of work on sequence of returns risk. Yep. Uh, which, you know, really comes into play uh, in a lot of different cases, but certainly if you want to do a, a Bill Bengen 4% constant dollar, yep. I mean, that's like exposing yourself to probably the most significant sequence of returns risk. But I'm curious, it seems to me that sequence, I'll call it sequence of inflation risk. Mm -hmm. is really 
the more serious concern because it's cumulative, right? Well, unless we went into a, a prolonged period of deflation, mm -hmm. we got 9% this year. And that just gets added. If you're, if yep. this is your first year in retirement, that doesn't just affect you this year. It affects you for the rest of your life. Absolutely. Right? With returns, as we know, they go up, they go down, they go back up, they go back down, and they slowly, hopefully, gradually go up. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, you know, while there's a lot of talk about sequence of returns risk, and it's a serious risk, isn't inflation our bigger concern when we're in retirement? So... So yes and yes and no. I mean, I certainly agree like this impact of inflation is significant. It's particularly pernicious for that very reason that you know to like this isn't just like a high inflation year as though it's a bad market return year. Like this is the new baseline for all future spending and it and it compounds out in some really challenging ways. I I think that so just like you know, nerdy finance and for me, uh you know, we tend to decompose returns into a couple of components. Like there, there's some, you know, it, initial return that I get, like the raw gross return. Uh, uh, I can net inflation against that to get to some level of real after tax, or excuse me, after inflation return. I'll come back to tax in a moment. And what really drives sequence of return risk at the end of the day, like it's it's not the, not, we'll call it the nominal returns, the gross returns. It's the real returns. It's the real returns after inflation. And so absolutely like high inflation becomes a challenge, frankly, because it means you you might come out the gate and say, like, this is great. I'm getting higher returns. It's like, yeah, but after inflation, you're not you're not actually getting higher returns. Like right. your return just got grossed up by inflation. You may not even be doing better than you were before. And frankly, like a lot of the fixed income environment today is a great example of this, right? I see a lot of folks like, this is great. I can finally get two in my savings account instead of 0 0.25 it's like yeah but inflation went to nine like you're actually losing more now at two percent yields yeah. than you were a few years ago at near zero percent yields so sequence matters sequence really ultimately drives much more off of real returns than nominal returns okay. and you know, we'll give you like we, we we've written about this a bit in the past as well that just literally like sequence of return risk is much more correlated to real returns than than nominal returns so yeah, like high inflation environments then become very concerning and challenging because often when inflation comes, particularly when inflation kind of spikes up quickly, uh, a lot of the rest of the return environment lags before it catches up, right? Like in, in theory, if I'm going, if I'm supposed to keep getting even a mere 0% real return on my bonds right now, I was getting like one or two a few years ago, I should be getting like nine to ten percent on my bonds to get a real return above my nine percent inflation and i'm not getting that right now i'm not getting anything close to that except so, for i bonds we do have that <laughs> yes except for I bonds. uh and so that becomes a, a huge concern but it's it's not it's not the inflation per se if i could actually go and buy an unlimited amount of of you know, well, I, I bonds giving me my return above inflation environment right now I wouldn't actually be as concerned about inflation. If I was confident, like, well, my stocks will give me my equity risk premium plus a base risk free rate that is tied to the rate of inflation, then frankly, I should be getting like double digits on my stocks right now as a baseline return. And then I wouldn't feel so bad. Like, I'm not as worried about inflation if I'm actually getting 15 on my stocks every year, but I'm not right now. And so that's a problem. But that's that's not purely a function of inflation, at least as, as I think about it. It's a function of real return. But yeah, the fact that inflation has spiked up and market returns and fixed income returns have at least not yet adjusted to that is a is a huge just sort of headwind right out of the uh, right out of the gate for anyone who's retired or just a headwind for anybody who is right. in the retirement uh, well, stage. Well, the, 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 there's many ways to try to address all of this, right? Um, yep. you've, you've talked about rising equity glide paths where you actually start maybe with a as an example, a 30-70 portfolio, 30% stocks. And maybe, I guess maybe one way to do it would be to spend down the bonds for some period of time until you get to 50-50 or 60-40. Um, and you've written about that. And by the way, I'm curious, and I think you wrote wrote about that with Dr. Fowl, right? Um, yep. uh, have your views on that changed at all since you've published your work? Uh, on kind of rising equity glide paths and, you know, ultimately we kind of turned it around and talk, I talk about it more these days as a, a bond tent 
right? Like I'm yeah. going to build an extra bond allocation. That I'm going to wind down. It just, it feels a little more naturally intuitive than I'm going to start with less stocks and build them up, even though a minus B is the same thing. You get to the, you get to the same place. Um, yeah, I like, I, I'm, oh yeah, we're, I'm still an advocate around just kind of that, that research and that approach. We've done more of it just behind the scenes on our work. And, you know, as, as, as I've continued going down that path, like no, nothing that I've seen, the continuation of that research pulls me away from just what what we'd found and what we'd done originally in that in that research. You know, it's it's all it's all just built around the fundamental premise that, you know, like oversimplifying a little, you know, my retire you know, markets go up and down. I mean, that's just sort of the nature like there's good years and there's bad years. So for my retirement, this is going to happen one of two ways. It's going to be good and then it's going to be bad or it's going to be bad and then it's going to be good. If it's good and then it's bad, you know, sequence of return risk is a double-edged sword. You get so far ahead in the early years if you get a good sequence out of the gate, it takes relatively few really good years at the beginning before you quickly get so far ahead that even severe market pullbacks and bad stuff can't break your retirement anymore. Yeah. Which means if you have built your bond tent and you're hiding in it in the bull market, you still have enough equities on the table that you build a cushion and you do well. If you get the bad version, right? Markets tank out of the gates and then take a long time to recover. If you built safety in the bond tent, you you just do better. And, and even in an environment like this, you know, I, I mean, there was a lot of discussion that we got around the, the bond tent research just when rates were basically zero and people were saying, why do I want to put my bonds? In, uh, why do I want to put my money in a bunch of bonds that are making zero? It's like, the point is not to make money with it. The point is to not lose money with it if the rest of your portfolio is not cooperating. And that works. That works in bad environments. That works in bad bond environments because as bad as a bad bond environment is, it's still not as bad as a bad stock environment, which loses a whole lot more money. So, yeah. you know, we're, like, we're still as confident in that research and framing as, as we ever were. The asterisk I will still put to all of it, though, is like, it is a risk minimization strategy. It's not a wealth maximization strategy. Mm. That's right? a good point. Wealth maximization on average is own as much stocks as you can possibly tolerate yeah. and ride it out. <laughs> right. That is your wealth maximizing strategy uh, with the caveat that if you own too, too much in stocks, you may have to at least rein in your spending for a couple of years or you can get too far off track with the yeah. bad sequence and, and play out the bad <laughs> sequence scenarios. So... Uh, it's not meant to maximize wealth. Maximizing wealth is own a whole bunch of stocks as much as you can tolerate and let it run and just modulate your spending if you have to. Yeah. But the basis of that research is there's a whole lot of folks that either A, don't want to take that level of risk, B, don't just don't, don't want to ride that ride in retirement, right? Even a lot of people who were fairly aggressive in retirement, they're, or excuse me, in their, in their working years, they're, you know, is, I've seen it sitting across from a lot of retirees over the years. There's just this kind of switch in our brains sometimes that changes when you like when you actually stop work and you wake up some morning a couple of months in and like turn on your computer and open up your investment accounts to take a look at what's going on and have this like, oh, blank moment saying like, this is it. Like, this is all I've got to go on for all my days left on earth. And it get, it can get scary for some people to say, yeah, I was uncomfortable with a certain bumpiness this ride before. Like it's not, a, because no. I knew at the end of the day, I could work a little longer, I could do something else, I could side else, I could make a little more money. And like, it just doesn't feel quite the same when you really that have- That is so life. true. I can tell you from experience. Oh, this is it moment, yeah. yeah. So, you know, so some just don't want to take the risk. Some maybe like they were there before, but, maximizing the dollars is not my primary goal right now. Like yeah. enjoying the dollars I've got to do the things I like to do, it becomes the primary goal. And for some, just at a high level, the, the uh, not necessarily stability of portfolio, but like stability of lifestyle yeah. is most important to them. You know, I, I, I have followed and written some as well around the research of like, hey, if just like you want a method that doesn't fail, just do an RMD style method for your whole retirement. Like take your portfolio, divide it by your life expectancy. You will never run out of money. I mean, just yeah. like mathematically, because you recalculate every year. It'll be, You'll a, never be a bumpy out. ride. You will never run out of money. But it's going to be a bumpy ride. Yeah, like you you do this and you get to environments like, you know, 2008 or 2020. It's like 
So you retired in 2007 and bought your dream home and then the market crashed and you had to cut your budget by 20 plus percent. So you have to sell your dream home. Then the market recovers in 2011. You can't go back and buy your dream home again because like someone else bought it from you and they're not giving it back. So there's a there's a volatility that a lot of us like, you may be able to ride out some volatility in your portfolio, but we don't necessarily want to ride out spending volatility at 100% of portfolio volatility. And so part of the nature of bond tent style strategies is how do we create enough of a buffer that when markets are going to do some of the fluctuating they do, I've got enough of a buffer in there that my spending doesn't have to experience that level of volatility. I'm not trying to die with the most dollars. I'm trying to maximize the ability to live the lifestyle I want to live that I can afford with the nest egg I've accumulated as long as I don't do anything particularly bad to break it. And when those priorities shift, then the strategy looks different. You know, when we look at this internally with our clients, like we have people that go that risk minimization route and we have people that say like, look, I'm going to live a great lifestyle. If bad things happen, please call me and let me know and I will change that lifestyle. And unless bad things happen, I'm going to keep living this lifestyle. And that's the way that they engage us. That actually kind of goes into another topic you've written about, and that's guardrails. Yep. And I'm sure there's many ways to implement a guardrail. Uh, one that I think you've written about is it, it, I, just as a hypothetical. Maybe you started 5%, you adjust it every year for inflation, but before you actually take the distribution, you calculate, hey, what percentage of my portfolio am I actually taking out? And if it's below 4%, then you can maybe get a 10% increase because you know, you've know you got plenty of wiggle room. Maybe the market's been really good and inflation's been low. And, and, and that will keep you from, say, underspending. On the other hand, if you do the math and you're taking out more than 6% of your portfolio, mm, could be risky. Let's cut back. We'll take a 10% uh, uh, reduction in our spending. Um, and I really like, to me... Well, to me, the, the the best approach is to to spend at a level that you could spend forever and not go broke, right? Permanent withdrawal kind of number, maybe three and a half percent or something. Uh, but not everyone can do that, and so if you're if you're closer, you know, that kind of guardrail approach really resonates with me as a way to do it. My question is, have you ever back tested it? We need someone to back test it. Has that ever been back tested, to your knowledge? Yeah, so so it has it has been back tested. Um, so that that guardrail framework, I mean that one in particular, kind of like you start at five and and set and set your rails at four and six. So that came from a pair of um, journal financial planning papers back in the mid two thousands by a planner in Minneapolis named John Guyton. Oh, Guyton uh, did that. Okay. So he did he did one in two thousand four, then he did a follow on two thousand six with a computer programmer named Bill Klinger who yeah. like. Went went full on in all the 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 scenarios. I remember, those, though, I remember Guyton Klinger being far more complicated. Uh well, so so Guyton had a couple of layers in it. The starting point was essentially that kind of four six framework. You know, um, uh, uh, he called I forget uh, the prosperity rule and the preservation rule or something. Yeah, yeah, it? right, like, right. The two guardrails. So. Guyton had a few other layers in there as well that were just meant to be other ways to keep you on track. Uh, the the sort of the two other big layers that were in Guyton's paper was he actually had one that said if you ever get inflation that goes like higher than six percent, cap yourself oh, six percent. When is that going to ever happen? Yeah, I know. Yeah, he was so mocked for that when he uh, uh, <laughs> when he did it back then. But you know, but it was looking off the data of the seventies. Like yes, as yeah. we discussed, like high inflation gets gets pretty painful. Uh, he also had sort of a lighter weight version of that adjustment that. Uh, that we we actually published some follow up research on later that essentially was if you get to the end of the year and the total return of your portfolio is not positive, like just net return less than zero, you don't get your inflation adjustment this year. You just you have to give up this year's inflation. See, now, conceptually, that doesn't conceptually it, that doesn't make sense to me that you would have that rule and a four and six percent buffer. Like, why would you need both? Uh, so the, the idea of it is, is that, you know, by the time you do the four and 6% rule, if you hit one of those guardrails, that's a 10% change. Just a, you know, that, that's a non-trivial, yeah. that's a non-trivial change. Now I know like the, what, the reason why John set those thresholds where he did when he made that system originally, just sitting across from clients, I've been through the same thing as well. Like 10% hurts 
But usually you can do that without a drastic change to lifestyle. You rein in a bunch of things. It's not pleasant, but it it's it's usually not like, a, okay, I got to sell the house. And I can't do all my, I can't hang out with my friends anymore. And I can't afford my old lifestyle kind of thing. And the idea was that that was deliberate. Like, let's set the guardrails at a place where like, yeah, it'll hurt. Because unfortunately, bad things are happening. We got to make an adjustment. Yeah. But like, it's not going to drastically change your lifestyle. So the primary reason that you put uh, a, you know, the kind of adjustment that he had as well, the like, if you're not positive, you don't get your inflation adjustment every year. So current year notwithstanding, most of the time your annual inflation adjustment is nowhere near 10, right? It's one, one, two, three, four kind of thing. So it's a very modest adjustment, but making that as a modest adjustment helps to keep you in the guardrails and helps to keep you away from whacking a bad guardrail that could hit a 10, right? So if my choice is like, hey, there, you know, if, if I'm going to have a not ideal sequence, there's a couple of ways I can go about this. One, I keep spending until I whack into the bad guardrail, take a 10% slice, and then I have to wait to rebound to the good guardrail to make it back. Or as I'm getting non-ideal returns, like, I lose 1.3 this year off my inflation adjustment. I lose 2.4 a few years after that off my inflation adjustment. Now I don't even quite hit the bad guardrail to have to take the minus 10 gotcha. because I took a two and a four. And then it's faster to hit the good guardrail until eventually I make it up and I swing to the good one again. So okay. it's 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 essentially kind of a, a, a dampering effect so that you're actually a little less likely to hit the bad guardrail in, in the first place. And, and it's worth noting, it's actually a really, uh, it's actually a really powerful long-term effect as well. So um, again, yeah. let's, we'll, we'll give, we'll give uh, listeners a couple of links as a follow-up at the end, but we, we'd, we'd written about this a couple of years ago. It is a really interesting phenomenon that, like, I mean, I would, I witnessed this with our, with our clients going through um, 2000, 2008 in particular, like bad stuff happened and everybody came in it was essentially just like tell me how much i gotta cut for a couple of years like i mean just everybody knew markets were down even if you were investing relatively well like you might be down less but you were almost certainly still down so everybody came in with the like just tell me how bad it's gonna be and like i'm i'm ready to tighten my belt a lot for the next couple of years Except what you find when you dig into the the research is that if you have to make some kind of adjustment like that, you know, like some bad stuff's happening, you've got to make an adjustment. It's essentially two ways you can go about it. One is what I call the large temporary cuts. These are the tight in my belt. Like, all right, I'm gonna like cram my spending down for two or three years until we get through this. And, and it's where I find most people's heads intuitively go. Like, I'm gonna I'm gonna chop off my spending for a couple of years here until we get back on track again. You know, a lot of people have, you know, experienced that tighten your belt phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah. The alternative is you do something like saying, nah, then I'm just going to not take my inflation adjustment this year. Now that doesn't feel like it should be remotely as helpful, like giving up my, well, at least back then, like giving up my 1.5% inflation adjustment is not as helpful as taking a 20% a cut off my spending to get off track. Except as it turns out, it's way more helpful. Because when you think about this over a, like a 30 year retirement period, if I'm spending four or 5% in the first place, taking off 20% from my budget for a couple of years, trims off sort of cumulatively from my portfolio, like two or three points of spending. Like, you know, I, I took myself from a 5% withdrawal rate down to a four for a couple of years until, until the ship writes. If I cut off a point, just a point or two of inflation, whereas you noted at the beginning, that's not just a point or two this year, that's now a new lower baseline for every year they're right. after. Giving up an inflation adjustment is like trimming off one or two percentage points of my spending for life. Yeah. Which means I can actually save way more off my lifetime spending by just giving up a year or two of an inflation adjustments that current year notwithstanding, most of the time I would hardly notice. I mean, most of the time we just, we just kind of spend whatever's in the checking account. So if I distribute a little more of the checking account, I spend that. If I don't distribute a little bit more of the checking account, I spend that. Most of the time we can navigate, a, you know, I didn't get my inflation adjustment this year just in the normal slush of cash. Except the irony is I gave up my inflation adjustment 
actually helps as much or more, then I'm going to do this massive belt tightening thing that's way, way harder. So, and, and then, by the way, and afterwards, go back to your, your original trend line. With the yeah, big yeah. And, and then right. and then you may still kick back in the in the original right. trend line right. later. Right. So okay. to me, it was it was an underappreciated part of of Guyton's study. I mean, I think he originally did it just to kind of dampen down how often you whacked off the bad okay. car rail before you got back to the good one. But it's actually a super powerful effect in the first place that for those who have a bad start out of the gate, just like you're going down a bad sequence path, trimming out inflation adjustments and just being true to that, which means you really like. You have to not take extra distribution yeah. to make up yeah. the fact that everything got more expensive. Like it'll feel a little bit pinchy, but it's better to feel a little bit pinchy and, and normalize to that than you know put yourself through a really big spending cut sure. that you're hoping to make back later. Except it turned out you didn't even need to do that. Okay, that spending. makes good sense. So it's like when the market's down, you don't get your your inflation adjustment. That's like the rumble strip on the side of the road. It warns yep. you that you're you're yep. getting close. Yep. And then things really go off. You hit the hard rail and you get you get a 10 percent deduction uh, reduction, assuming that you've hit it at the six percent bumper. And, um, and to me, the striking true. thing about all of that is just, you know, guidance baseline on that research essentially put you at a five to five and a half percent withdrawal rate instead of you know yeah. sort of a, a banging level four. And to me, just like that's a big deal to recognize on a relative basis, right? On a relative basis, like. 4% to 5% is a 25% increase in lifetime spending, right? If you just put that into dollars, like you go from 40 grand a year on a million to 50 grand a year on a million. Yeah. It's a 25% increase in standard of living. And, and all you have to do, air quotes, like all you have to do for that is be willing to accept some level of spending vol uh, variability, right? Where right. either you don't get your inflation adjustments or you, or you may, might hit the occasional guardrail and have to make an adjustment. And to be fair, like, you know, have sat across a wide range of retirees over the years that, that we've worked with. Like, for some people, that is totally fine. Like, I, I mean, heck, if you really get down to the math of it, if you go down a Guyton rule and you hit a bad guardrail, the first guardrail you hit, you're still above Bengen's four. <laughs> like, you, you actually have to, like, hit the guardrail, bounce off it, and bank into the guardrail a second time just to get down to well, bank spending in the first place. But I take it, though, I think you've done research on that, right? I mean, because, I, you know, on an after-inflation basis, Bingen is just a flat line, spending line, right? It's flat. Um, well, flat, flat adjusting for inflation, real basis. Yeah, right, after inflation. Guyton Klinger, you're going to start above it, mm -hmm. um, and you're going to stay above it, depends, right? Depends on how things turn out. But you're going to stay above it for a while. Likely, you're eventually going to go below it, but, oh, not, uh, not, not necessarily. I mean, no, not necessarily. Right. I mean, you have to bear in mind, even, even from Bengen's end, like original 4% rule, if you run it through all the historical scenarios that are actually out there, because I mean, that, that's where it came from. Yeah. 96% of the time under Bengen's rule, you die with as much as you started with. Right. Half right. the time you double your money, a quarter of the time you quadruple your money. On top of on top of all the lifetime spending. Well, two two things there though. I mean, the the point I was making though is even if you do end up going below the line, you end up having more inflation adjust, adjusted dollars to spend, say, in the first half of retirement, yeah. which, which I think is when most people will spend it. Mm -hmm. But to your second point, you know, because you did a great work on the Cape, right, and yeah. how that. So, but you know, the stock valuations. But if if you look at where we are right now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, it, it, this is the it's time not looking good. It's not, yep. Yeah, it's right. not looking good. It's we're we're probably at the bottom of the the spending yep. range. We're at the four yep. percent range, probably. Yep. Um, but I, I, to me, I mean, the the takeaway around it, I sort of twofold. Like, part of the interesting effect to me of what comes from the Guyton research and just like the magnitude of this gap you get between where Bangman started and where Guyton started to the point that like, you got to whack off the, you got to like bounce off the guardrail of Guyton twice just to get down to Bangman. You got to hit it a third time to get lower or multiple years of give up inflation yeah. to, to erode down over time. The the takeaway to me in essence is that baseline assumption in Bangman. And like, I don't fault it. I've done the research as well. Like you got to start with some assumption. 
But it turned out that baseline assumption that like you never do anything to adjust, even if like horrible things are happening. I mean, like it's the Great Depression and you just steam right on through. It's like the 1970s stagflation and you just nonchalantly go along as though nothing is happening around you. Yeah. That assumption is actually quite constraining. And it really forces the spending level a lot lower to deal with the fact that while 96% of the time you finish with more than your starting principal, four out of 100, you finish with less. And one out of those four, you're careening down to zero, which is why you have to do only four, which is where the 4% rule came from. Yep. So yep. if you've got some level of spending flexibility, and granted, not everyone does. I mean, like, we've got clients just like, any spending change is a catastrophe. I'm happy to take raises. I'm yeah. not taking a cut. So, you know, we ratchet them down a little lower. But for those who have any level of spending flexibility, it turns out even relatively modest spending flexibility, a la Guyton, where like, it's a down year. I'm just going to not take my inflation adjustment. I hit a bad guardrail. It's just a 10% cut can re-anchor you to a spending base that's 25% higher, which is a really yeah. big Big deal. Lifetime standard of living oh, yeah. change just for being willing to have a little bit of uh, of adjustment along yeah. that. Well, I know our hour's up. Can I? I want to sneak in one last quick question. Sure. sure. I don't think enough attention is paid to fees and the four percent rule. You know, if you're doing an AUM at one percent, um, <laughs> which is standard, right? I mean, yeah. well, and you take forty grand of your million, you got to turn ten grand over to your advisor. Um, and I'm not, I'm curious as an advisor, do you talk to your client? I mean, do advisors talk to their clients about this? Do they have a fiduciary obligation to say, look, yeah. here's your spending money. It's 50 grand this year, but just so you know, our fee is 10 and yep. you're not going to write us a check. It's not going to hit your credit card. It's just going to come out of your account every quarter, but it's a real expense. So when you're budgeting your money, make sure you account for it. How does that play out in sort of the real world? So it like certainly does. I mean, we're, you know, I mean, I mean, we do this, we live, we live this model with our retired clients. So have very much lived it firsthand. Uh, yeah. So, so a couple of things, just like one, you know, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm an advocate for us, for our industry overall, like the fees all need to be there. The fees all need to be transparent. If we can't justify our value with our fees, then we shouldn't be doing what we're doing or you shouldn't hire us and find another solution that, uh, that, that costs less. So like, very strong advocate fees need to be out there and seen and visible. We all need to be super clear about about what they are. Um, you know, in ter so in terms of the particular dynamic of how do fees sort of couple with withdrawal rates, there is an interesting kind of mitigating effect that comes from this. So I'll give you one more link into the chat so you can follow follow on with this for the the folks that want to see the the gory math to this. So here's the effect, like in year, so let's say we have a client that like, they need the 4% rule at 4% because like, it's going to be that bad. They are going to barely make it to the finish line after 30 years. Like this is one of the scenarios where you're actually going to go to zero by the end. So in year one, 1% fee is, you call it 10 grand on a million and you're spending at 4% is 40 grand on a million. So the 10 is 10 off of 40. When I get to the end, year 30 by now i'm probably uh my spending inflation just is probably north of 100 and if i'm in a spend down scenario like basically the last year i spend the whole hundred because like that's the last check but that means in that year my spending is 100 my my aum fee at that point would be one because it, it recalculates and it goes down as your as your portfolio goes down so in year one, the AUM fee is taking one out of every $4. In year 30, the AUM fee is only taking one out of every $100 because that's all you've got left at that point. So the, the effect that occurs is essentially AUM fees and that model in, in the bad scenarios becomes a self-mitigating effect. Uh, the cost goes down in the scenarios that you're spending down and it diminishes its own impact. Now that doesn't make the impact of fees go away, but what we find at the end of the day is like if you know if my initial safe withdrawal rate was four and I'm paying a one percent fee, it turns out four minus one is about three and a half. Four minus one isn't three. Four minus mm -hmm. one is about three and a half. A half of it is just like the true drag off of the impact of fees on lifetime spending. The other half is well, as I'm spending down, 
the advisor's fee starts winding down and they they lose a little bit as I lose a little. Now, if you get a good market scenario and markets are going up, frankly, the fee is going to have a much more direct effect, but it's going to turn out like you start out spending four. It turns out your safe withdrawal rate was seven because it's a bull market. The fee was taking one off of that. So it should have been seven minus one equals six, except you are only spending four. So you're actually still more than fine. Like the fee did not impinge your standard of living because your returns were exceeding the baseline that you needed anyways. So in the spend down scenarios where that fee drag like truly matters from a sustainable retirement incomes perspective, the fee does matter, but it's not as dramatic as we make it out to be because of that spend down effect. You really find like four minus one isn't three, four minus one is about three and a half. And there's actually a secondary effect that if you stack on top of that, the drag of taxes, uh, however you want to look at either uh, taxes drag down your returns, which means your fees actually end up being lower over time because there's less portfolio that the advisor bills on. Or conversely, advisory fees, at least in some cases, historically have been deductible. If you can deduct any portion of that fee, if we get that deduction back at some point, that also partially comes off. And so any scenarios or the interplay between taxes and fees, either the fee is deductible in some cases or uh, the taxes reduce the size of the portfolio and therefore reduces the size of the fee. When you mix taxes and fees together, what you end out with is four minus one equals about 3.7. So well, it's interesting. There are there's papers on this and, and, and you're right. It doesn't actually translate to 1%. Yeah. Um, based on at least the research I've read. Uh, uh, yeah. Although, um, you know, one, one could look at it just from a pure spending. How many dollars do you have to spend on an after fee basis? Mm-hmm. And there it's just, your safe withdrawal rate minus the fee, and that's what you've got left. Um, So, well, good. Well, I've taken up more of your time than I had promised. uh, I I hope this was helpful for everybody that's listening. I see all of the links you've put in the chat. I I will leave those below the video. If you have others that you think of afterward, please email them to me. I can always add them at any time. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Happy to share out. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate right. everyone for dialing in. Uh, it was good uh, Good to see all the chat moving along as well. So awesome. Oh, great. Take care. Appreciate it, Michael. Awesome. Thank you. Take care, everyone. All right, gang. Well, th- that was a lot of fun for me. I hope you enjoyed it. You know, I, I, I'm going to do some more videos on this question of fees and safe withdrawal rates. The research I've read actually is consistent with what Michael said, even though mathematically you might think that I can't be. What am I missing? Of course, it does, as he pointed out, it still doesn't change the fact that what, what, whatever the impact ends up being, fees take away spending money. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll circle back on that. I will add links to the videos uh, soon, l- later today. And uh, there you go. Hope you had fun. Uh, I know I did. Uh, I will be back on Monday for a live Q&A. Hope to see you then. Uh, and until then, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial.